Champion by Ring Lardner. Mitch Kelly scored his first knockout when he was 17. The knockee was his brother Connie, three years his junior and a cripple. The purse was a half dollar given to the younger Kelly by a lady whose electric had just missed pumping his soul from his frayed little body. Connie didn't know Midge was in the house, else he never would have risked laying the prize on the arm of the least comfortable chair in the room, the better to observe its shining beauty. As Midge entered from the kitchen, the crippled boy covered the coin with his hand, but the movement lacked the speed requisite to escape his brother's quick eye. What you got there? demanded Midge. Nothing, said Connie. You're a one-legged liar, said Midge. He strode over to his brother's chair and grasped, grasped the hand that concealed the coin. Let loose, he ordered. Connie began to cry. Let loose and shut up your noise, said the elder, and jerked his brother's hand from the chair arm. The coin fell onto the bare floor. Mitch pounced on it. His weak mouth widened in a triumphant smile. Nothing, huh? All right. If it's nothing, you don't want it. Give that back, sobbed the younger. I'll give you a red nose, you little sneak. Where'd you steal it? I didn't steal it. It's mine. A lady gave it to me after she pretty near hit me with a car. It's a crime she missed you, said Midge. Midge started to the front door. The cripple picked up his crutch, rose from his chair with difficulty, and still sobbing came toward Midge. The latter heard him and stopped. You better stay where you at, he said. I want my money cried the boy. I know what you want, said Midge. Doubling up the fist that held the half dollar, he landed with all his strength on his brother's mouth. Connie fell to the floor with a thud, the crutch tumbling on top of him. Midge stood beside the prostrate form. Is that enough? he said. Or do you want this too? And he kicked him in the crippled leg. I guess that hold you, he said. There was no response from the boy on the floor. Mitch looked at him for, uh, for a moment, then at the coin in his hand, and then went out to, into the street, whistling. An hour later, when Mrs. Kelly came home from her day's work at Faulkner's Steam Laundry, she found Connie on the floor moaning. Dropping on her knees beside him, she called him by name a score of times. Then she got up, pale as a ghost, dashed from the house. Dr. Ryan left the Kelly abode about dusk and walked toward Hall Street. Mrs. Dorgan spied him as he passed her gate. Who's sick, doctor? she called. Poor little Connie, he replied. He had a bad fall. How did it happen? I can't say for sure, Margaret, but I almost bet he was knocked down. Knocked down? exclaimed Mrs. Dorgan. Why, who? Have you seen the other one lately? Michael? No, not since morning. You can't be thinking. I wouldn't put it past him, Margaret, said the doctor gravely. The lad's mouth is swollen and cut, and his poor skinny little leg is bruised. He surely didn't do it to himself, and I think Ellen suspects the other one. Lord save us, said Mrs. Dorgan. I'll run over and see if I can help. That's a good woman, said Dr. Ryan, and went on down the street. Near midnight, when Mitch came home, his mother was sitting at Connie's bedside. She did not look up. Well, said Mitch, what's the matter? She remained silent. Mitch repeated his question. Michael, you know what's the matter, she said at length. I don't know nothing, said Mitch. Don't lie to me, Michael. What did you do that to your brother? Nothing. You hit him. Well, then I hit him. What of it? It ain't the first time. Her lips pressed tightly together, her face like chalk. Ellen Kelly rose from her chair and made straight for him. Midge back against the door. Lay off me, Ma. I don't want to fight no woman. Still, she came on breathing heavily. Stop where you at, Ma he warned. There was a brief struggle, and Midge's mother lay on the floor before him. You ain't hurt, Ma. You're lucky I didn't land good, and I told you to lay off me. God forgive you, Michael. 
Mitch found Hop Collins in the showdown game at the Royal. Come on out for a minute, he said. Hap followed him out on the walk. I'm leaving town for a while, said Midge. What for? Well, we had a little run-in up at the house. The kid stole half a buck off me, and when I went after it, he cracked me with his crutch, so I nailed him. And the old lady came at me with a chair, and I took it off her, and she fell down. How is Connie hurt? Not bad. What you running away from? Who the hell says I was running away? I'm sick and tired of getting picked on, that's all. So I'm leaving for a while, and I want a piece of money. I ain't only got six bits, said Happy. You're in a bad shape, ain't you? Well, come through with it. Happy came through. You oughtn't to hit the kid, he said. I ain't asking you who I can hit, snarled Mage. You try to put something over on me, and I'll get you the same dose. I'm going now. Go as far as you like, said Happy but not until he was sure that Kelly was out of hearing. Early the following morning, Midge boarded a train for Milwaukee. He had no ticket, but no one knew the difference. The conductor remained in the caboose. On a night six months later, Midge hurried out of the stage door of the bo Star Boxing Club and made for the Duane Saloon two blocks away. In his pocket were twelve dollars, his reward for having battered up one of the demon Dempsey to the six rounds of the first preliminary. It was Mitch's first pr professional engagement in the manly art. Also, it was first time in weeks that he had earned twelve dollars. On the way to Duane's, he had to pass Neiman's. He pulled his cap over his eyes and increased his pace on his, until he had gone by. Inside Neiman's stood a trusting bartender who, for ten days, had stocked Mitch to drinks and allowed him to ravage the lunch on a promise to come in and settle the moment he was paid for the prelim. Mitch strode into Duane's and aroused the napping bartender by slapping a silver dollar on the festive board. Give me a shot, said Mitch. The shooting continued until the wind-up at the star was over and part of the fight crowd joined Mitch in front of Dwayne's bar. A youth in the early twenties standing next to young Kelly finally summoned sufficient courage to, add, to address him. Wasn't you in the first bout, he ventured. Yeah, Mitch replied. My name's Hirsch, said the other. Mitch received startling information in silence. I don't want to butt in, continued Mr. Hirsch, but I'd like to buy you a drink. All right, said Mitch, but don't overstrain yourself. Mr. Hirsch laughed uproariously and beckoned to the bartender. You certainly gave that whoop a trimming tonight, said the buyer of the drink when they had been served. I thought you'd killed him. I would if I hadn't let up, Mitch replied. I'll kill him all. You got the wallop, all right, the other said admiringly. Have I got the wallop, said Mitch. Say, I can kick you like a mule. Did you notice the muscles in my shoulders? Notice them? I couldn't help from noticing them, said Hirsch. I says to the fella sitting alongside of me, I says, look at them shoulder. No wonder he can hit, I says to him. Just let me land and it's goodbye, baby, said Mitch. I'll kill him all. The oral manslaughter continued until Duane's closed for the night. At parting, Midge and his new friend shook hands and arranged for a meeting the following evening. For nearly a week, the two were together almost constantly. It was Hirsch's pleasant side role to listen to Midge's modest revelations concerning himself and to buy every time Midge's glass was empty. But there came an evening when Hirsch regretfully announced that he must go home to supper. I got a date for eight bells, he could find it. I could stick till then, only I must clean up and put on the Sunday clothes, cause she's the prettiest little thing in Milwaukee. Can't you fix it for two? asked Mitch. I don't know who to get, Hirsch replied. Wait though, I got a sister, and if she ain't busy, it'll be okay. She's no bum for looks herself. 
So it came about that Mitch and Emma Hirsch and Emma's brother and the prettiest little thing in Milwaukee foregathered at the walls and danced half the night away. And Mitch and Emma danced together for though every little one step seemed to induce a new thirst of its own. Lou Hirsch stayed too sober to dance with his own sister. The next day, penniless at last, in spite of his phenomenal ability to make someone else settle, Mitch Kelly sought out Doc Hammond, matchmaker for the star, and asked to be booked for the next show. I could put you on with Tracy for the next bout, said Doc. What's they in it? asked Mitch. Twenty if you cop, Doc told him. Have a heart, protested Mitch. Didn't I look good the other night? You looked all right, but you ain't Freddie Welsh yet, by a considerable margin. I ain't scared of Freddie Welsh or none of them, said Mitch. Well, don't pay out boxers by the size of their chest, Doc said. I'm offering you this Tracy bout. Take it or leave it. All right, I'm on, said Mitch, and he passed a pleasant afternoon at Wayne's on the strength of his booking. Young Tracy's manager came to Mitch the night before the show. How do you feel about this girl? he asked. Me, said Mitch. I feel all right. What do you mean, how do I feel? I mean, said Tracy's manager, that we're mighty anxious to win, because the boy's got a chance in a filly if he cops this one. What's your proposition? asked Mitch. Fifty bucks, said Tracy's manager. What do you think I am? A crook? Me lay down for fifty bucks, not me. Seventy-five then, said Tracy's manager. The market closed on eighty and the details were agreed on in short order. And the next night, Mitch was stopped in the second round by a terrific slap on the forearm. This time, Midgey passed up both Neiman's and Dwayne's, having a sizable account at each place, and sought his refreshment at Stain's farther down the street. When the profit of his deal with Tracy were gone, he learned, by first-hand information from Doc Hammond and the matchmakers at the other clubs, that he was no longer desired for even the cheapest of preliminaries. There was no danger of his starving or dying of thirst while Emma and Lou Hirsch lived. But he made up his mind, four months after his defeat by young Tracy, that Milwaukee was not the ideal place for him to live. I can lick the best of him, he reasoned. But there ain't no more chance for me here. I can maybe go east and get on somewheres. And besides... But just after Mitch had purchased a ticket to Chicago with the money he had borrowed from Emma Hirsch to buy shoes, a heavy hand was laid on his shoulders and he turned to face two strangers. Where are you going, Kelly? inquired the owner of the heavy hand. Nowhere, said Mitch. What the hell do you care? The other stranger spoke. Kelly, I am employed by Emma Hirsch's mother to see that you do right by her, and we want you to stay here till you've done it. You won't get nothing but the worst of it monkeying with me, said Mitch. 